This podcast is sponsored by my counseling practice, Elizabeth Polinsky Counseling, where I offer weekly marriage counseling, weekend-long marriage intensives, and therapist training in emotionally focused couple therapy. To learn more about my marriage counseling services, visit www.elizabethpolinskycounseling.com. Welcome back to the Communicate and Connect podcast. This is episode 42, Advocating for Yourself as a Spouse and as a Military Spouse with Brooke Hill Murphy. All right, I'm really excited that we have Brooke Hill today to talk about how to advocate for yourself as a military spouse. We actually met through a therapist group for military spouses, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Raquel, why don't you share just a little bit about yourself and your experiences and so people get a feeling for who you are. So thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm a licensed graduate professional counselor in the state of Maryland. It means I'm provisionally licensed, but you know, meet weekly for supervision and maintain my own caseload. Um, so I primarily work with adults that experience different types of trauma. I'm an EMDR therapist, right? Which is a trauma modality. So Mm -hmm. I primarily use that when working with adults. And then I also see military couples. Um, I'm trained in EFT, which I know you are as well. Um, And so I incorporate that in sessions. Yeah. Awesome. That is, that's really exciting. You may have told me that, but I'm like, I'm spacey this morning. And so just hearing you say that, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. (laughs) I, um, of course, I love that you're doing EFT um, and trauma work is so important. So many of us, like if you think about trauma broadly, we all have some type of trauma that we've gone through in our lives that also then directly impacts our relationship. So I see those as going really well together, your two specialties of EMDR with for working with trauma and the EFT piece. Mm-hmm. So that's great. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I'm excited for it yeah. and to keep learning about it, you know, as I progress in my career. So this podcast is really for, for military relationships. So then um, I want to make kind of the connection of why is advocating for yourself important and how is that even related to relationships, like how, how does advocating for myself then actually help my relationship if I do that? Um, But let's just start from the individual level. (laughs) Like, um, tell it, tell us why you think advocating for yourself is important as a military spouse. Yeah. So when I just think of, you know, self-advocacy and the importance of that, just in general, right? So advocating for your needs and desires, right? And communicating those. And so when I think of that in a military relationship, right? Like with all the demands and the pressure and the transition and the change, right? Like the advocacy changes over time. Um, and it's it's really unlike any, it feels, I don't know, being a military spouse, like it feels unlike any other advocacy like I've ever had to do. Um, and I think mm-hmm. it's so easy to get lost in, the demands and the pressures and the title of the military, I think for the service member and and the spouse, right? And so just navigating that together is ongoing and challenging. Yeah. Can you um, say more about how it's different than the other times you've had to advocate for yourself? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, I mean, I've, you know, gone through school and, and lived in different places and had different jobs. So I feel like that I've I've kind of advocated in those areas, you know, most of my life. Um, yeah. But I was I was really met with a lot of hard no's when advocating for myself in those areas, you know, when we were stationed overseas, you know, and and I feel like so many times I could have just, you know, stopped and took the no and I guess did something else, right? But But I really felt so strongly and just maintaining who I was, like maintaining my identity and continuing to grow in the ways that I wanted to grow, regardless of the demands of the military. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking it, it's sort of tied to resiliency. Like as you were talking about that, 
the word resiliency came to my mind. Um, and, and certainly, like, if it was something that didn't matter that much to you, maybe a no is fine. It doesn't mean that you're lacking resiliency. But mm-hmm. the fact that there was something that mattered so much to you, that even when you were faced with no's, that you kept advocating for yourself to find mm-hmm. a way towards it, that to me yes. feels very resilient. Yeah. 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 And looking back, yeah, I think it feels resilient and, and I'm happy that I did it. But I remember in the moment it it felt devastating at times. But I think that's where my partner came in and right, like mm-hmm. supported advocating for myself, right? And supported me emotionally, physically, right, at times. Um, you know, yeah. So I feel like that that they go hand in hand, right? Advocating and then and then having that support from from your partner or other sources, right. To continue yeah. that. advocacy, Yeah. Yeah. That's so important to it like helps keep your motivation up to keep advocating when you have a supportive person in your life. Exactly. Yeah. I think um, when I think about this in my own life, kind of very similar. I, I, for me, I think my career is like one of the most important aspects of my life. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and certainly that's not the case for, for everybody. Other people have other parts that are really important, but for me, that is like one of the primary things. And that is the part where I had to advocate a lot. And I think for a long time, I sort of, I sort of like blamed the military. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can't do what I want to do because of the military (laughs) or, um, or like I, I, I had to give up my dream job because we moved. And I think for me, what, what sort of helped me transition was this idea, well, I, I get to choose what's next for me. And I can, I can sort of take responsibility for how I want my life to look, even when it's not how I want it to look, and try to find a way to move forward. And that sounds very similar to what you did. Yeah. And I definitely relate to the blaming at times. Uh, definitely. Definitely. After the overseas move, it was, it was um a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of change. Yeah. And it's that, yeah. And it is a lot of change. I definitely don't want anyone listening to, to think that I'm like belittling how hard that is. It is so hard. Um, the loss is massive at times Mm -hmm. um and to feel out of control I guess in so many ways is very hard Mm -hmm. but I think for for me in like my own journey it was like I almost like I had given over control to the military (laughs) um they And they did, they still have so much control, you know, so that's, that's not like totally gone, but it, when, when I could somehow find a way to, to take back control, to feel like I am the one who's responsible for the choices I make next, then that really freed me up to, to feel like I could pursue what I wanted. Mm -hmm. What do you think helped you? Like when you've had to advocate for yourself, what, what helped you do that? Again, I think it was the support from multiple people, but also just like you said, the career was so important to you for me. So when it, when, so my husband and I met when we were 18 and 19, right? Ah. So, yeah. So I was, um, I was at community college and met him, you know, like at a party or, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, and he was actually joining the air force and, um, you know, did all, did all the things, you know, I went to his, his graduation and everything. And his first duty station was Japan. Um, and, and so I think, think that was the first time that I really, you know, obviously we had to kind of assess our relationship, right. Are we uh-huh. going to stay dating? You know, is it going to be long distance? Is it going to, are we going to get married? And, and we both agreed that marriage wasn't the right next step. We, you know, we felt we were um, just not ready, you know, um, for multiple reasons. Um, and so I stayed home and finished, I mean, went to my bachelor's program, um, moved around a bunch, you know, studied abroad, um, 
and just kind of just did whatever I wanted, right? Like whatever felt like it was, you know, feeding me. And like you said, kind of taking back some of that control, right? Like it was the hardest thing, you know, that the most important person to me was so far away. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but like taking back some of that control for myself um, and just doing what I wanted to do educationally, job wise, travel wise, like exploring what I wanted to explore. And, and this is kind of where he came in again, right? Like he was a cheerleader, right? He was like, Uh Now study study abroad, right? Like I never was met with, you know, well, why would you do that? You know, or don't do that, right? And and again, he was so far away. And so I was disconnected from the military in a way, right? But but that was really kind of my in that time, just my like lifeline was was being able to do what I wanted to do and and getting that support from him. And so I think when we got married and I then accompanied he, him in Germany. I kind of kept that going and and felt like, you know, there was, I had, I don't know, this drive in me, right. That was like, there's no way, (laughs) like, I'm going to let, you know, the military dictate what I'm going to do and who I'm going to be. Right. And so I did choose a master's degree program. I started my master's degree before we got married. I did choose a program that was, that was, um, I could do online and I knew I could finish my internship and practicum, you know, like that last piece that we have in our programs, overseas. Um, and so that was kind of already in place, but then of course I get there and I'm like, I need a job, right? Like I need friends, I need community. Like Mm. that's really important to me. And I kind of was hit with like a wall of like, you know, to me, it was like, I don't know, I guess my expectation was like, it's going to be easy to find a job. It's going to be easy to make friends. It's going to, you know, and, and it wasn't. And that was hard. That I think yeah. that transition was one of the hardest transitions I've ever gone through. Um, because you're, you're so far away. He was, um, you know, of course, busy with the demands of the military, obviously full time. Right. Yeah. Um, and I kind of just got there and it was exciting at first, right. Being in a new country and, and I guess having the option to eventually travel. Um, but then, yeah, I got there and I'm like, okay, you know, we, we hung out and, and did a few days of whatever he wanted to do. And then he went back to work. And I remember one day just laying on the sofa the entire day. And I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, yeah. this is not me. I, I can't do this. And and of course, I was looking for jobs and stuff. It took me six months to find a job. And that was with a bachelor's degree and going through a master's degree program. And that was because the jobs just weren't available, right, to military spouses and so I was looking on base, of course, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it took me six months and eventually I got a job on base working at, at a hospital. And once that happened, things felt like they started to pick up, right? Like I started making friends at work. I obviously had a job. Um, we got a dog, right? That helped. Um, mm-hmm. And and so everything started picking up and and it was going well, right? And I felt like I was kind of bit by bit kind of gaining my self-identity back, gaining these really important things back. I met some really great people in my neighborhood, right? That were part of the military community. And they were a huge piece of me being okay there, a huge piece. And, you know, and then I guess the education piece kind of hit a wall, right? You know, I'm I'm going through my program. um, And then of course COVID happens and I needed to find practicum an internship site right? Be able to, you know, finish that requirement and then start practicing as a therapist. And I reached out to, I think about a year in advance, I reached out to the person that the program coordinator of the, the program that apparently like existed at the hospital for behavioral health people to do internships and, and things at the hospital. And she answered and I sent, I filled out all the information and sent it back. And I'm like, okay, like this seems like easy, right? You know, I'm like, uh-huh. oh, it seems like there's a program, <laughs> right? And and then, you know, once it started inching closer to the date, I reached back out and, you know, I kind of was, got this email that felt like a really hard no, you know, they're like, they're PCSing. They didn't know who was going to be stepping in as the program coordinator. And they didn't know if the program was going to continue. And, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I was, I was devastated. mad. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah like devastated yes. and frustrated. And um, 
all all of it, like all the things, right? And and be, but because I worked at the hospital and I was trying to do my internship and practicum at the place I worked, I very quickly started just asking around. Like, you know, certain people would come in, you know, onto the the unit right from different parts of the hospital. I would be like, do you know who's taking over the program, right? Is the program continuing? Just started to use my resources because, you know, I'm like, I have access to the email addresses, right? I have access to, you know, the phone to call different units and ask around. And so I started doing that. And someone finally gave me an answer after a couple weeks of this is the person that's taking over the program. And as soon as I got that person's number, right, I started calling. And um, the, I think when one day I called her like three times because she was going from different units <laughs> and I like kept missing her. And she finally answered. And, you know, she's like, yeah, I'm taking over the program. Um, you know, I don't know what I guess in what units are available for like interns yet like they're still trying to figure all that out and I'm like can I meet with you now like I'm at work can I go over there because you know she was on the same base I'm like can I meet with you now um she's like yeah so I went over there you know of course like got a break right I went over there and had all my stuff printed out and I'm like this is what I need I explained everything to her um and she let me know that they were considering like her, her, she was considering like taking on an intern in on her unit. And I, I guess because I had gone over there and just looked organized and driven and motivated. um, She was really motivated to have me as an intern. Right. You know, when she met me and and I I think, I guess down the line, once I interned with her and, and, you know, got pretty close with her. Right. And we had a good relationship. She, um, she let me know that that was one of the things that was so important was that I showed up and I was ready and I advocated for myself. And, and that was the reason that she took me on as an intern. Um, Yeah. Yeah. What a journey you've been through is what I'm thinking. And so many, so many times in different ways that you had to advocate for yourself and in different sort of like different areas of your life. Let me see if I can like pull out some of the things that stood out. So one, like towards the beginning, you said kind of like you did things that you wanted that felt nourishing for you, that, that, Mm -hmm. that, I don't know, for your soul or, you know, who you are, um, that, that was a big piece of focusing on what do you want and doing those things that you want. And then I was thinking in this, in this next section around kind of the career with the move to Germany, you were, you were sort of persistent. There was, there was a way that you knew this is what I want. This is what I'm going to go after. And you asked for help. You didn't try to just do it on your own. You, you thought about these are the resources I have around me. How can I try to tap into those resources to get to where I want to go? Um, I think those are the big things that stand out to me. Do you, I, I don't know if you feel like I might be missing a piece of it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking focus, like knowing what you want, doing the things that you want, asking for help when you need to, and then being really persistent. Those are the qualities that really stood out from your story to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree that I think... Wait, kind of what you just said, I didn't even realize really, but like the, the asking for help and the support, you know, at times it was hard because obviously people didn't like need that need. Right. You know, I kind yeah. of put myself out there to ask. Right. And, and sometimes people, you know, didn't answer my emails. They didn't answer my phone calls. Right. And and that was hard, but I, you know, I did have people that really cared, right. Like my supervisor, um, she advocated for me. I mean, it, so once she decided to take me on as an intern, we did all the paperwork and everything. And then we had to, of course, work with the education department to get their final, like, go ahead. And no one was answering the phones. We were getting, like, automated um, emails. She was going over there trying to talk with someone. I was calling, trying to talk with someone. And it was this automated email that was saying the program was on hold because of COVID and soldier readiness, right? And yeah. so, yeah. Oh so, we were, like, <laughs> yeah, we were hit with that. And it was... I mean, that was, that made me angry, right? Like, I'm like, I work here. I want to work in this other unit and give more of my time. And like, I have all the things, like, I'm like, I have a cat card. I have all the things that I need, right? And it's like, I couldn't even communicate with someone and say that. Like, I'm not coming 
you know, where they would. And oh, and the biggest thing was that my school had it had an agreement already on file with the school, with the, um, the hospital that was valid and not expired. Right. And I couldn't even talk to someone and say that, like, there's literally nothing on your end that you guys are doing besides saying I can do this. Right. And, and that, I mean, I was in that period of like, not knowing if I could do it just based on that for about like three months. I, I mean, I couldn't get a hold of anyone. No one would, you know, and no one was answering. Right. And, and so actually the chief of the unit that I was working on transferred to the education department and I knew him. Right. And so I kept calling, I kept calling. And one day he finally picked up and I said, um, you know, I work on this unit. I know you from there. Um, and, you know, he was kind of saying, no, like, you know, you can't do it. No, like go somewhere else and do it. And, and I'm like, I, I remember just being like, sir, I don't have any other options right? Like, you know, this is my only option. There's an agreement on file, right? And and a really big piece was that if I even pushed my internship off from um, for a semester, it would interfere with when we're PCSing, right? Mm-hmm. So I would have had to start and then finish somewhere else. And I knew that would have been terrible. <laughs> like, yes. you're right. Yeah. Headache, right? And so he finally just kind of said yes. And I was able to start like Three days before my my semester started, I got like the go ahead of I could do it. Oh man, such yeah. a close deadline. Um, yeah, I was thinking the as you were saying that, I was thinking other things that you you were doing that helped you advocate for yourself was sort of this pre planning ahead. There was a lot of pre planning ahead to try to get all of the things to line up, um, mm-hmm. but then also you used anger, which I think is so great. I mean, like I, I would also be tempted like to just be on the couch, you know, like those, especially when you get so many no's or so many blocks to what you want to do or where you want to go. Um, it is devastating. It is sad, but sadness kind of like deflates you, you know, whereas Mm -hmm. anger is very energizing. There is a way that like you could access your anger as, as like a motivation to keep going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely say that that was, yeah. that was kind of like what was pushing me um, and like really pushing me out of my comfort zone too. Right. Because mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know if I felt like, you know, the most confident calling the chief of an education department. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. But it's like, I just uh-huh. had this this drive of like, I'm just really not going to accept no, um, you know, and, and especially after I had already done, like you said, all the planning, like I had checked to make sure the education agreement was on file. I had reached out, I had found the program coordinator when there wasn't one essentially yet. Right. Like no one knew of one. And, and so I, I, that was really what was pushing me. I think it was the anger and the frustration and, and just feeling like, like, I'm not going to let, like, like, I'm not going to let this happen. Like, I can't. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a friend who says you have to make the choice first. Mm-hmm. Like you decide this is what's going to happen. And then you find a way to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but that it starts with the sort of the decision. Yeah. Um, and part of, I think another thing that came to my mind, what you're describing that you did is, you didn't let uncomfortableness or like fear or anxiety stop you, even though it was uncomfortable to call the chair or the chief. I don't remember what you called them, but even though that was uncomfortable, you still did it, mm-hmm. um, which is huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So I know we've, we've kind of been like pulling out these pieces of what helped you really advocate for yourself in these different areas um, but I also know that you are, you know, practicing as a counselor. So mm-hmm. how do you talk to your clients about advocating for themselves? Are there any things that you recommend based on that sort of side of your experience for how people could advocate for themselves? Yeah, and I think one of the biggest things that we kind of already pointed out is like the support, right? Like mm-hmm. the support system that can be such an important piece, like whether it's your spouse or a friend or a parent, um, 
or a coworker, right? I mean, my coworkers were like cheering me on every day, even helping me at times, right? Um, and and so I think that that's a really big part of it is just reaching out for that support, um, you know, and and yeah. I think that's really important. I mean, I think that's how I would, you know, talk to a client about that, right? Like first yeah. noticing who who do you go to for support and just making sure that that's in place um, before making or trying to make the, these really uncomfortable, you know, like decisions and putting yourself out there. And, and not that you need the support first or anything like that, but it can be really helpful, right? Because there were a lot of times that I didn't I got the support and it, it just like like was nourishing and feeding my soul and just kept me going. Yeah, that is so I think you are onto something with that. Because if if I keep getting blocks, that's, Mm -hmm. that's kind of unmotivating, you know, but then if I have, you know, three or four people who I know are going to be supportive, Mm -hmm. then they can help me find the willpower, I guess, or the energy or the motivation to keep trying. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I think also brings us maybe to um, maybe some like intentionality of picking your support system. Like not everybody Mm -hmm. is supportive in all things. (laughs) Like, um, like I remember, um, I remember when I wanted to get my master's and my dad, my dad was like, why would you get that? (laughs) He's very supportive you know, in other areas. But at the time, he he just thought that didn't make any sense to go do. So Mm -hmm. he would probably not be the person, you know, other but my mom, she was all for it, you know, so um, while some people can be are supportive overall, they're not always supportive on this one thing that I'm trying to do. So who who can I be intentional about with their my support system for this thing? Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that really brings up a good point too, right? Because, you know, we know that our partners and spouses can't be all the things for us all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this was definitely taking a toll on my spouse over time, right? Like the unemployment financially. I mean, I was wanting him to meet my emotional and social needs right when I got to Germany, which was a lot to ask. Right. And I mean, the other thing was that I wasn't command sponsored when I went over there. So it took six months for that to happen. So I couldn't drive. Um, You know, there was a lot of roadblocks there. Right. So um, we got married by proxy in Germany. Um, Okay. And yeah. And so um, there there was a lot of pressures there from the military in general, um, you know, and so, yeah. So it's like at times he was having a hard time with everything that was going on. And so you know, then I called a friend back home, you know, like I called my sisters, you know, and he was very supportive a lot of the time, but sometimes, you know, he couldn't meet that need for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a way that you, you were like, how can I meet my needs? How can I make sure I'm okay? Mm -hmm. Um, And you, you, and also like giving your partner grace to not always Mm -hmm be 100% the perfectly supportive partner, because that's very hard for any of us to do. Yeah, I like, I just like what you're talking about. I think all of this is so, so important. And because they're the reality of military life is that there are blocks, like all the time. Mm -hmm. And I suppose in life in general, but I think, you know, more so (laughs) um, with, with being associated with the military. And Mm -hmm. I think it's even a good reminder, like for me, like when I face blocks, these are the things that I can remember. Who can I go to for support? How can I think about what I want? Try to be mm-hmm. persistent, ask for help if I need it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I think another piece too, um, in terms of what I would say to a client too, I guess is just, um, you know, like empowering to empowering a person, right. To, look for the resources, right? Because there are many resources available to military spouses, um, you know, and so look there too, right? Um, And ask questions, (laughs) ask, call places and ask questions, right? Um, Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of resources. They're sometimes hard to find. They're, they're like, um, 
I don't know. Like when I look at the websites and stuff, I'm like, this is so much information. I don't know where, <laughs> where to find what I'm looking for. That it takes some persistence, even in that, um, yeah. to find some of those resources. Yeah, exactly. And like I did the my CA scholarship when we were in Germany, and that's actually what funded the my um, EMDR like thing and and some other things, right? And um, and so that was that was that was an empowering piece, right? Like there was a scholarship that existed for military spouses, right? For education. And that was something that I had, right? That that kept me going too and was like feeding my soul and 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 it felt it felt good to be able to um prioritize, I guess, certifications and additional schooling that I wanted to do because yeah. of that resource that was available to me. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I'm thinking that we're we're getting close on time. Do you have any sort of like final thoughts or tips or words of wisdom for anybody listening and thinking, you know, I don't know if they're long distance or if they're struggling like with blocks in their career, any mm -hmm. final words you'd want to give them? Yeah, I feel like what I needed to hear, right? Like I, when I was going through it was just that it's it's possible. Like it's possible to do what you want to do and meet those needs. It really is. And there are people, you know, in, in the communities, right. That want to help. And I know it's hard. <laughs> it's so hard to be met with so many no's and feel like, you know, I remember feeling spouse education, not the priority. <laughs> like I, I felt like I heard that message a million times. <laughs> like I'm like, I get it. Right. Um, but yeah, but it's definitely possible. Um, and it's hard and, yeah, I think just that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I th I think that is probably really helpful. Cuz that's the that's the danger is that I think I might want to give up thinking it's not possible. Mm -hmm. And so I love your words yeah. of wisdom. Yeah. Thank well, you. um if people want to I don't know, work with you or or ask you questions or find you in some way, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, so I currently work um, at a group practice right now um, called Anchor Counseling Centers. It's in Maryland. Um, so you can find me on their website because I have a profile. Um, and then you can also find me on Therapy Den. I have a profile there as well. Um, and then I did want to mention that I recently contributed to an app called How to Get Through. Um, the app is launching in March of 2023, so very soon. Um, but the program that I contributed um, is called How to Get Through Long Distance Relationships. Um, so obviously that applies to our military community. Um, and I do talk a lot about um, why people are feeling what they're feeling, you know, in long distance um, what's going on in their body, like what's contributing to what they're feeling, attachment styles, you know, hormones, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then just how to get through it. So um, some practical tools, you know, to get through the long distance. And so, yeah. yeah. And so I think that's probably going to be very helpful for a lot of people. I know so many military couples are long distance. I mean, of course, the, the deployment <laughs> is a long distance moment, but who are long distance for for a long period of time. I think my husband and I were long distance for like a year and a half where we just lived in different places. Um, and I know you were, you were, yeah. um, so three I'm glad. Years. Oof, three years. Yeah. Um, yeah. oh, that's hard. My like heart hurts hearing that. <laughs> um, yeah, but so I'm glad you have that resource for people. Yeah. Well, Brackel, yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for being on the podcast. Um, I really enjoyed our, our chat and I think it's going to be helpful for lots of people. Yeah. Thank you for having me. hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please take a second to go rate, review, and subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. Make sure to check out the show notes to sign up for our free 10-week relationship email course. This email course is really designed for people who are, are maybe having trouble with communication or connection in their relationship 
and helping them develop some quick wins right away to start improving it. While I am a therapist, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered therapy. And it should also not be a replacement for therapy. If you think you need a professional of any kind, you should definitely go find one. Until next time.